Good evening. My name's Gil Gelati. I'm a professor of English and Latin here at uh, Central Connecticut State University. On behalf of the CCSU Media Board and the New Britain Institute, the co-hosts for this event, let me welcome you near and far for those people who are online. I'm a founding member of CCSU's Media Board, a student faculty board created in 1997 to offer student leaders a forum where they can gain insight and advice on current issues and concerns of student media organizations. The board is comprised of the recorder, the newspaper, the Helix, the literary magazine, and the radio station, WFCS 107.7 The Edge. We're on the edge of your dial, you are on the edge of your seat. I'm also a member of the Board of Managers of the New Britain Institute, the umbrella organization of the New Britain Public Library, the Youth Museum and Hungerford Park, and the Industrial Museum, as well as, once upon a time, the New Britain Museum of American Art. A little history. CCSU was founded in 1849 as the New Britain Normal School, the first public institution of higher education in Connecticut. The New Britain Institute was incorporated in 1858 with the mission of creating a public library and hosting an annual lecture. Featured speakers at this lecture included such luminaries as Mark Twain, Frederick Douglass, and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Not to set the too bar too high, Ron. Um, the Institute is pleased to be partnering this year with the Media Board with support from the Hospital for Special Care and the New Britain Museum of American Art to offer what is sure to be an engaging and informative evening. Of course, an event like this that brings together partners from across the university and across the region doesn't happen without many, many hands. While I cannot mention everyone, let me acknowledge a few. Jeffrey Bray, the president of the New Britain Institute, Wendy D'Angelo, Vice President of Development and Communications at the Hospital for Special Care, Jeffrey Manville, Director of Operations at the New Britain Museum of American Art, Dr. Amy Pozorski from the CCSU Department of English, and Dr. Natsuko Takame from the CCSU Department of Special Education. And finally, without whom we'd all still be thinking, so how are we gonna pull this off? Sue Sweeney, Associate Director of CCSU's Academic, uh, Student Activities and Leadership Development Department and Executive Secretary of the CCSU Media Board. Please give them all a hand. Thank you. Um, Hi. It sure is nice to be here in New Britain. Uh, I, I discovered love in this town. I fell in love in this town. Yep, and that love uh, is someone that I will call after the show. That would be Cornelia. We ran a US Senate campaign here many years ago in 1982 for a guy named John Downey, Jack Downey, who ran for the Senate. He ran against, uh, in the primary, against a guy named Toby Moffat, who was your congressman in this district, very successful congressman, very able campaigner too. We lost. And, but everything happened here. We had our headquarters in something called the Andrews Furniture Store downtown. Uh, and we went through a journey together here and became us, the two of us. So the idea I'm back in, in New Britain is making me tingly all over. But look, let's just sort of lay uh, the fabric of how I end up here. Now, look, if you're going to know me, you need to know my sun and moon, my mom and dad. I, I'll introduce them very, very quickly. And then you'll understand how we actually get to life animated. Uh, you know, I was uh, uh, raised under uh, a kind of motivational methodology that was popular for someone like me born in 1959. Um, and also uh, particularly uh, sort of uh, embraced uh, in case you were wondering, I'm, I'm a Jew, I'm Jewish, so this is deep in my people. And it was more, more or less this. My mother, who was a little ferocious woman from Brook, Brooklyn, about this tall, she, she didn't say it in exactly these words, but it was more or less this. She says, I won't love you any less if you're not a success. I just won't mention your name to other people. So, which is essentially true. 
Well, years later, as a reporter, I would be interviewing this person or that, and they weren't all Jewish women, but, you know, there was a predominance. And I'd say, we've gone 45 minutes about the son and the doctor. There's another child? Oh, okay. Can we talk about them? It worked. It worked. I ended up being a person who worked ferociously to win. To, to win the competitions of meritocracy. Second place was unacceptable. At one point, I had done something, and she says, if you're not president by 30, you'll be a disappointment to me. I'm like, Mom, the Constitution, I think, says 35. Don't give me excuses. <laughs> I love this woman, this ferocious little Brooklynite. She married a guy who had enormous ease in the world. Everything came easily to him. Uh, add five inches to me, a smaller nose and a chin, that would be my father. He's a handsome guy, brilliant fella. Um, as I said, an ease, an ease of the world. He uh, didn't have much ambition until he met my mother. She implanted it. He ended up being an insurance agent. She wanted him to go to law school, but he went for life insurance. You know, and he had to use these skills to get, to do a difficult thing, which is to get from that front door to the kitchen table to have someone think about their death. Now, that's a hard product to sell. Again, back then, it was only, uh, you know, men got life insurance. They were the breadwinners in that era. And so he manages to do this, and he's successful at it. He gets to that kitchen table. Uh, he sells the life insurance policy. But in the process of doing this, he also developed acuities about life that would end up being very handy. Uh, so, because he would often have to deliver death benefit checks from time to time to widows that he had spent time with at that very kitchen table with the kids playing on the rug and talk to them about the passages of life. This may be all the money you have. So now what? This comes in really handy for this fella when he is 46 years old and he wakes up at dawn of one morning as the sun comes through the window, and he reaches over uh, to the pad on the night table, and he begins to write. He writes, I hope you boys never read this letter, but I cannot ignore what the doctors have said. My chances of survival are slim. Pancreatic cancer, 46. It's a beautiful letter to me and my brother about living the worthwhile life. It says extraordinary things in this letter. I think often about why we don't write these sorts of letters to our loved ones, why it is so rare. It talks about the values in our home, that he had values in his home, and those are values that he's carried into the world, and they're values in our home that I have brought here, and your mother, and those values, they're all you'll need. It's like a little architecture, a compass and a sexton. And they will carry you boys forward. He says lovely things, like, I, I can't believe that you are my sons. I burst with pride beyond expression when I look at you. He says something interesting, um, just at the, it's only a two-page letter at the top of the second page, handwritten. He says, and another thing, uh, you boys don't owe me and your mother anything. You've given us more by being a presence in our life than we ever possibly could give to you. My, my mother disagrees with that almost at every level. <laughs> you owe me big, both of you. <laughs> Everything you are, you owe me. 
they're both right. At the end, he says, but one thing I'll ask of you. Life is precious, so is time. Do something worthwhile with your lives. Something you can be proud of. Make that the star at the center of your constellation to guide you. And everything will work. Trust me. But you'll find, as you go forward, your days will be filled with vicissitudes and almost inexpressible joys and sometimes disappointments. And the letter ends on that word, and it ends unfinished. And in some ways, I've been trying to finish that letter for him. So that's me. I meet an extraordinary woman, the fair Cornelia. Here in New Britain is where it happens. And I am a very fortunate man. We end up living in the Boston suburbs in a little starter home. I have a job at the Wall Street Journal, uh, and I'm ecstatic. It's one of the big newspapers in America. I'm in the Boston Bureau. We have this little starter home in a town called Dedham, uh, which is in the south of, of Boston, kind of west-south. And uh, we've got two perfect children. We don't use that word much anymore, but we did then. Walter's five. Owen's about two and a half. And uh, everything's working out. Just perfect. You know, we're in that moment where, you know, man plans, God laughs. But it's all working out. Dad gets a big job in Washington, the Wall Street Journal senior national affairs reporter. And it's an exciting time for the family. We, the, the moving van, we pack up. Walter's got his goldfish in a bowl with a thing on the top. And we're in the, in the truck. A great adventure. We get to Washington, and after a few weeks, Cornelia is, well, she's dominating our conversation after work. I don't even tell her what's happening at the Wall Street Journal office because there's too much for her to tell me about what's happening in the home. She says, something's wrong with Owen. I mean, look at him. He's not even looking at you. His speech is vanishing. He had a few hundred word vocabulary. You know, the basic stuff for a two-year-old. You know, I love you, where are my Ninja Turtles, let's get ice cream, you know, the basics. And it was shrinking. And, and he would walk off, and you'd call him, and he wouldn't turn. Owen! Off he goes. Then he's down to one word, juice. A single word. We were terrified. You know, our son had vanished. It was like we were looking for clues to, to a kidnapping. Where did he go? I mean, God forbid, did he, did he ingest something toxic? Did he bang his head? I mean, kids don't grow backwards. We take him to a doctor. The doctor's like, you're out of my league. You need to see a specialist. And we take him to the specialist. You know, tall woman, white smock, eminent specialist. I'm sure a fine clinician. She says, okay, Iran, you stand at the end of the hall with Owen. And Cornelia, you stand here. And then have Owen walk from Ron to Cornelia. And I'll watch. You know, we know what's about to happen. These days, Owen has what you'd call the drunkard's walk. Weaving around like someone walking with their eyes shut. And I whisper to him. I say, hey, buddy, just walk like you used to. Just this one time, OK?
Cornelius snatches him up. I, I don't think I've ever s- seen her hold him so tight. She's just going to love this out of him. The doctor sits us down and says, okay, this is called autism. And I'm like, like Rain Man? That autism? She's like, yeah, yeah, but, um, but he had speech. Um, and when the regression is this steep, it's called regressive autism, it's about a third of all the cases. When the regression is this steep, uh, often they don't get speech back. And that's the last thing I heard in that meeting that day. Everything else was noise in our ears. And Cornelia and I had the same exact sensation as though we were lifting out of our bodies up there near the drop ceiling, looking down on this couple in the chairs and the doctor and the kid on the rug going like this with his hands. We left those people in the doctor's office. They didn't leave with us, all right? I mean, I used to miss them, okay? (laughs) Not so much anymore. There was an innocence about the two of them that we lost. And our life is essentially that life now, the life after that visit. Everything changed. The first thing, we needed to find a new doctor. <laughs> because immediately we had already eviscerated this doctor. We weren't a mile out in the car. We already had thrown her into the gutter. What does she know? This is ridiculous. We needed another doctor. And we did. We found another doctor that, I don't know what it was, we instantly bonded with this guy. And, I, and I'm not sure why. He, he was a Jewish guy about that tall. But suddenly he was just right for us. Mostly what he did is he treated us so that we wouldn't run out of the room when he used the A word. He's like, okay, well, we call this pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. I'm like, oh, I love that term. That's a big, I don't, means nothing. He's like, yeah, just a big, giant smush. Autism. That becomes our life. That doctor said, oh, so Ron, what do you do for a living? I said, me? Yeah, yeah, you. I'm a reporter. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm like, what do you mean? So he just paid me $120 for this visit, and you're going to have to do three of these a week, and it's not covered. Oh, oh. You pretty good with numbers? I said, you know, not bad. Investment banking. Think about that. Because this is going to get expensive. I'm like, this is what I do. I'm a, I'm a journalist. I'm a storyteller. This is my thing. And he's like, well, you better be really good at it. I'm like, OK. <laughs> you know, after that, we're in the car. Almost everything seems to happen in our life in the car after doctor visits. Okay. I mean, something about a, a car. You know, you're sitting side by side, you and your beloved, and you know, you got the, the wheels and the, uh, the stripe going underneath them. You're looking out toward the horizon, which is what you do when you drive, not at each other, that's a little complicated. And you just look into the future. She's like, okay, so, um, uh, here's the deal. I've got my job, it seems, for the rest of my life. Cornelia was a journalist like me, and it's Owen. And your job is to make more money than any reporter in the history of journalism. So get to it. And that becomes my life. I didn't have a choice. In fact, what happened was is that I changed. I didn't even realize how. You know, a layer of my skin burned off. I started to ask a different set of questions. You 
You know, I, I began looking for people who'd been left behind in the world. I went across town in Washington where we lived to southeast Washington, some of the toughest neighborhoods in America for people in what Michael Harrington would call the other America. Somehow left behind became my beat. Of course, the most dramatically left behind person I knew was living in the bedroom of the house, deemed uneducable. Our expectation would be, according to our doctors, probably an institution. But I began to dig. I said, I know they're in there. Cornelia got me that great John Prine song, Hello in There. I used to play it all the time on this little cassette in those days. And we searched for Owen. Is he in there? He doesn't speak anymore. He doesn't look at you. I'm a pretty out there guy. Cornelia is wildly social. We're talkers. We have a child who's silent. We're also bankrupt, by the way. I'm making $96,000 a year at the Wall Street Journal. That's one of the best jobs they have. We had to borrow money from my mom. It isn't that she wouldn't offer it. The question is, can you afford to take it? I mean, I think the interest rates were reasonable. I'm joking. She didn't charge us. We were suffering. And we also missed our son. The only thing he seemed to want to do was watch movies. Disney movies. That was it. I mean, he just loved the Disney movies before the autism's onset, as his older brother Walter did. He's the missing actor of this little quartet, the older brother. Crucial player. You know, and he's looking at us saying, where did Owen go? He's gone. No, no, what are you talking about? Dad, where is he? I lost my buddy. But they could watch movies together, like they did when we lived up in Dedham. And so that's the one thing we could do as a family, is watch a particular movie, which Owen had embraced, which was a movie called The Little Mermaid. Anyone here? Let's just show hands. Anyone here see The Little Mermaid? Yeah, everyone here has seen The Little Mermaid. I mean, look, this is the beginning of what's called the new golden age of Disney. I mean, this is one of the biggest movies of the year, of all movies. And Owen just was enraptured with it. All he would do, every chance he got, every chance that he was home, Cornelia, of course, is dragging him to every therapist who hangs a shingle all day, every day. But every minute he's home, he's up on the third floor of the rented house in Georgetown watching The Little Mermaid. Now, his motor function went to hell. That's autism. You know, he had to go back to the sippy cup, all right? You know, but one exception, his thumb on the rewind button. He's rewinding going over scenes again and again. So we're up there, about a year into the silence, on a snowy day, and we're on the big giant California King watching The Little Mermaid. TV's up in a bracket on the corner of the wall. And he's watching a particular scene. Now everyone's seen the movie, so this is easy. Uh, it's, of course, the Faustian bargain with the sea witch. She needs to become human. It won't cost you much a trifle, really. Just your voice. Owen rewinds. Walter's like, Owen, just watch the movie. Second rewind, third rewind. And there we are, watching the scene that we've watched a thousand times as a family. Now, in the months up until this moment, Owen has uh, been saying, juice servos. And Cornelia thinks he wants more juice. So she gives him the sippy cup, but he knocks it over. He doesn't want the juice. But it's, it's, it's noise. It's like a word. And we're like, maybe he's going back to infancy, like baby speech. And he'll work his way back. Juice surface, juice surface. All of a sudden, he's rewinding. Third, fourth, fifth. <laughs> Cornelia grabs me. Just your voice. I'm like, what? 
Choose your pose. Just your voice. I grabbed Bob and went, just your voice. And he says, juice or pose, juice or pose, juice or pose. <laughs> he looks at me for the first time in a year. Cornelia and I are just over them, and Walter starts to tell, Owen's talking again. And Cornelia starts to cry. He's still in there. This becomes our life. There must be something about the movies. He's He's drawing from the movies, maybe, because, because then the next year is Booty Lies Witten. What's the next one in the progression? Little Mermaid. Right, Beauty Wise Within. We're like, that's the one word. We go to the doctor, Dr. Alan Rosenblatt, the short Jewish guy. We're like, oh, he picks that word out. Beauty Wise Within. I mean, could he know what it means? Alan's like, probably not. This is called echolalia. They just hear sounds and repeat them. I'm like, but why would he pick that? Or just your voice? A silent child. Or beauty lies within. A person who people look away from. Couldn't it be a choice? Why would he pick those three words out of an 89-minute run of dialogue. No way of knowing. And that's our life. Goes on for years. By the time Owen is seven and Walter is nine, he's up to about a three-word sentence, I want juice. And that has cost us about $200,000. But at least it's a sentence with a subject and a verb. And maybe he'll find his way back. So, let me just mention briefly the fourth actor, the older brother. Now, you know, look, the fact of the matter is there is a structure <laughs> to the brother of those with a disability or sister. They become little adults quick from the moment of recognition. Mom and dad have their hands full, I'm fine. Like a character out of Dickens. I'm good, keep in touch. <laughs> Walter is a tough little guy who never has a need. He's living an independent life. And he shows emotion only on one day of the year, on his birthday. That we don't even really recognize this. This doesn't fit our story about Walter, who we call the world's toughest Jew. Okay. He's fully self-sufficient. His emotions are his own. We don't even really see he gets emotional on a day marking him getting older. So, on Walter's ninth birthday, he's out in the backyard. His buddies leave. Cornelia and I bring in the cake and the cups. And Owen's out there with him in the backyard. And Walter must have gotten emotional. Because Owen follows us into the kitchen. And he has this crazy look in his face. Intense. He's looking at Cornelia and then at me and back and forth. And, and, and he says, Walter doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. Then off he goes. It's not only a big sentence, it's one with a comma in the middle and an insight that we don't have. We're like, what was it? It was like a thunderbolt went through the kitchen. Cornelia and I are struck silent and then we can't stop talking for hours. He's processing the world through the movies. My God, I mean, what else is going on in there? So after hours of this, <laughs> Cornelia says, look, I've got to go to sleep because Owen is up all night and Cornelia has to catch sleep whenever she can. Your job is to find a way back in. And I go up to the bedroom on the third floor. Now it's not a rented house. Owen's up there looking at a Disney book. I mean, we have basically everything Disney sells we have at this point purchased, everything. 
And I see on the floor is one of these plush toys. Those with children know the plush toys. It's about an, it's the Yago puppet. Yago, the evil psychic to the villain Jafar in Aladdin. Uh, Owen loves that movie too. Uh, and this is a $98 puppet. The idea I remember the price tells you a lot. And I see Owen on the bed. He doesn't read, but he likes the pictures. I don't want him to look at me. I want him to just be there flipping pages. I want to sneak up and I crawl across the rug. I throw the bedspread over my head. I grab the puppet. I pull it up right to the elbow. I push up the puppet. And in Iago's voice, which is Gilbert Gottfried, anyone can do it, the Affleck guy, I say to Owen, 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 how does it feel to be you? And Owen turns to the puppet like he's bumping into an old friend. He says, not good, I'm lonely, and I have no friends. Now, I bite down hard under the bedspread. I say, stay in character. What would Yago say next? When did you and I become such good friends? When I watched Aladdin, you made me laugh. We're having a conversation. The first one in five years. And then it goes on two, three minutes. And I hear Owen clear his throat, and he goes, I love the way your foul little mind works. That's Jafar, the villain. The next line of dialogue. I take off the bread spread. I said, this is it. We're communicating in Disney dialogue. I wake Cornelia up. I said, we have a way in. We have a way in. It's through the dialogue. Everything's in Disney. Let's get to it. Next night, we start what we call the basement sessions, all four of us. We need the TV because Owen's memorized all the movies, 50 of them, the whole thing, every single word. So we need the TV as our script coach. So we go with the Jungle Book. Everyone's seen that one too, right? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so we all have to play a role, so we pick our characters. Now, um, I go with Baloo, which, which works except the height issue. Cornelius Bagheera, the protective panther, Sebastian Cabot. Mowgli, you must go to the man village. The jungle is a place of danger. That's definitely Cornelia. And Walter is King Louis, the orangutan. And of course, Owen's Mowgli. Now, about seven scenes in, I say to Owen, you know you'd make one great bear. And he says, you think so, Papa Bear? That's the next line. And then he hugs me. And I'm not sure if it's Mowgli and Baloo or me and Owen. And of course, Cornelia says, doesn't matter. Of course, she's right. We do that every single night for the next four years, the basement sessions. I mean, look, we look like the rest of you, like, you know, normal people. You know, but we're not, OK? Walter <laughs> is out there as the most popular kid in the class. Cornelia is driving Owen to therapists, everyone she can find. I'm interviewing presidents for a living. But at night, we're all animated characters of every variety. Over four years, slowly he gets speech back. Not the speech when he was two. That flowed. That had intonation, just like the speech you hear. But it was speech. It had a rhythm to it. There was a staccato beat. It had a kind of, a kind of jumble. But you can make out words. And it was all because he created an emotional language out of lyrics and dialogue. He invented a language that we had to learn to speak. So let's watch a trailer to Life Animated. For those of you who haven't seen the movie, it's on Amazon and it's on forever because it's nominated for an Academy Award and they keep running it. So let's watch this trailer and then we'll watch another one and then uh, we'll finish up and I'll give you a nice finale. So here is Life Animated, uh, the movie.
there is a boy who is just like other boys. Until one night, he sees from his window a storm on the horizon. Oh, who are you? I beat the pet, and you can. All of a sudden, at three years old, Owen vanishes. The doctor says, let me explain what autism is. Some of the kids don't ever talk again. I remember thinking, I'm just going to hold you so tight and love you so much that whatever is going on will go away. We're beginning to give up hope. And one day, we're watching the Disney animated movies. And he says he doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. What the hell just <laughs> And all of a sudden, it became clear to us. He's using these movies to make sense of the world he actually is living in, our world. So at that point, we began to speak to him in Disney dialogue. When did you and I become such good friends? <laughs> Whatever works to get to Owen. I've been scared my whole life of growing up. Peter Pan doesn't want to grow up, because when you grow up, you lose all your magical and childhood oh, times. My hope is that he is independent enough to be able to grow older on his own. When I look in the mirror, I see a proud autistic man ready to meet a future that is bright and full of wonder. He's going to have to fall and fail. We're not afraid of that as we used to be. I just can't believe how far Owen has come. The future, I'm still searching for it. Who decides what a meaningful life is? It's like I always say, children, children got, got to be free to lead their own lives. lives. My family, there they are. I'm going to jump ahead to something you just heard there. Universities around the country have had weekend sessions um, talking to each other, professors and students, about that line you just heard Cornelius say, who decides what the meaningful life is? interesting. Something that we said to each other <laughs> after a doctor's visit. Some doctor who basically talked to us about cutting our hopes and losses. So you don't expect much here. There's not much happening in there. He's not really living a meaningful life the way you hoped. And Cornelia says, who decides that? Where's the committee? See, the change, the education, was already underway. Cornelia and I were being taught by a silent child lessons that would be the most important lessons in our life about a life of meaning. Who is the key part of that question? Who decides what the meaningful life is? It means you may not be deciding, though you think you are. You may be living in the decisions some society makes, some values that say meaningful, not, worthwhile, not, up to it, not. And it's important to recognize that. We have values and norms. We have judgments of merit. We have yardsticks that have enormous transactional outcomes. It's understandable that we want our loved ones to measure up. I think of my mother and I think of my father. She was living very much the American mother's life. She was saying, win, measure up. 
I won't love you any less, but get to work. Make me proud. My dad, lying there, knowing his days are numbered, said, you don't owe me and your mother anything. Live a life of worth that you discover. And it can be so many things. <laughs> he didn't tell us what it is or ought to be. It's for you to find. Of course, I have a son who teaches me that in ways that reshape me. Oh, and ends up in the discard pile of the meritocracy that we prize. He doesn't register. He's enormous joy. He connects with people. He memorizes things. <laughs> He remembers every day of his life. He's been to the movie theater thousands of times. He'll tell you every single day he's been there. It was that important to him. That was a Tuesday. We went to Mazza Gallery. Uh, that was a Thursday. You wore gray. Mom was in that blue sweater. It's a big day. An enormous awareness, but not one that society prizes, not one that gets him that A, that step up. But you know, that was squeezed out of us by him. He touches people, just like all the Spectrum folks I know. You know, we went to that first school with Owen on the short bus, we followed it in our car I was in a class with one other Spectrum guy and a, a Down Syndrome kid. Cornelia and I were sitting there observing on a little mat against the wall with our backs against the painted center box and feeling really bad about ourselves and about all of this. This is the way it'll turn out for him. I knew a kid with Down syndrome when I was young. I was no great shakes, but I wasn't very nice to that kid. He didn't even know when people were making fun of him. I just thought about all that. Then I look up and the Down's kid, you know, we're sitting down, he's only that tall, so he's looking at us right in the eye. He sees there are two miserable grown-ups sitting against the wall. I mean, what's with Cornelia? And he says, I love you. And he hugs me. <laughs> I didn't even know if he hugged Cornelia because I was upside down. There is not a Down syndrome kid or adult I've ever met who's not emotionally gifted. Never. And I met a zillion of them. I gave a speech in New Orleans. Many, many years later. <laughs> and I looked down in the well where the orchestra pit is. And someone had walked up from the big giant crowd. And it was that same guy. His name's Spencer. He's like, come on. Owen says, expert on all narratives, I helped you and mom find your inner hero, right? Yeah. All the things I'm prized for in my life as a journalist, what was it? Searching for the left behind people and finding a way in. I know there's a way. That was the life that happened after that doctor's visit. And Owen continues to teach us, as do all the Spectrum people I know. I interview presidents for a living. I walk at the top of the meritocracy. I teach kids at Harvard. 
all of whom demand A's no matter what, mind you. God forbid you should give them a B. You'll get a 10-page paper that probably was lawyered before it was sent to you. Actually, the more original stuff I got or heard, it was at Disney Club, the club that Owen ran at the school he was at on the Cape. Every one of them original. They didn't know the supposed to's. They didn't know what they were supposed to say or think to get the reward. It bubbled up pure. I'm going to finish with a little moment. It tells us about the things that we often miss but are right there in front of us. Owen has a philosophy. A philosophy he built over his many, many years of becoming a leading expert on the Disney pantheon of movies. Right? Again, he sees things others miss. He has heightened pattern recognition. Again, very common among the neurodiverse. And what is intelligence other than pattern recognition? But they have it in a particular way. Again, they don't know the supposed to's. They're not shaped by the download of think this and not that. Right answer, wrong answer. In a way, they are free of that. They say, this is really that. These things are the same. Why are these things not separated versus together? Really, isn't that this? That's autism. Freedom from the supposed to's. <laughs> if only. So his philosophy is interesting. And we hear it on a particular day. So, in 2018, uh, we got a call. Owen and I were invited uh, to Rome. Uh, there's a big giant conference there that happens every other year called Unite to Cure. And it's a, gi a giant group group of, you know, like George Church, the geneticist guy, and Joe Biden, and public health people, and it's about curing the world. And a lot of folks come, and Owen and I actually are the opening act. We're the keynote. And Owen on a stage is a miracle, because he just basically does lines from Disney and tells you what they really mean. Now, everyone's watched these movies. They're literally the lingua franca of the damn planet. And by virtue of him seeing more in them than we've seen, it throws everyone on their head. It's beautiful. We're the open. Two days later, they say, hey, guess what? The Pope may address the group. Not, not common. But we're thinking tomorrow morning he may do it. Sure enough, Saturday morning, we get a call at 9 in the morning. Everyone get to this hall. If you look at St. Peter's, it's just to the left. There's a big, giant meeting hall there. And about five or 600 people come. And sure enough, there's the Pope. He comes out of a little Harry Potter door, you know. And, he comes, and he's got these headphones on. And he talks to you. And you got headphones, too. And he says some very nice things. And then... Sometimes they say he'll come down and he'll walk the first row. Now they know that. So they line up on the first row a lot of like really old, rich Catholics who need the last blessing. Okay, and they're all there and he blesses them. No, 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 four seats down, I know, a shocker, is, um, is Katy Perry? Yeah. I know, go figure. I mean, I don't know, she wanted to meet the Pope. I think she's Catholic. And she's dressed to the nines, by the way. I mean, Katy Perry like, goes to wardrobe before she goes out to get milk. She's got this sort of, <laughs> this offering. It's like uh, a black Jackie Onassis thing. Pope talks to her, two more down, and there's Owen, the last man on the row. Now, it's getting beamed on a jumbotron to all billion Catholics, and there's Owen and the Pope. Okay. Now, Owen looks at the Pope the way no one ever looks at the Pope. Like, just another dude. And you can tell the Pope loves this. It's like, yeah. Owen's like, hmm, hey. Okay. They get in close, clasp hands, 
And Owen says to the Pope, and this is his philosophy, he's like, well, the sidekick helps the hero fulfill their destiny. It's really the most important role. The Pope goes, really? You can tell the Pope is going, ooh. And then Owen says, and you're the great sidekick because you, uh, you help the world fulfill its destiny. And the Pope starts to cry. At that point, I accepted Jesus as my personal savior. I didn't really, but I was close. <laughs> now just think about that moment. The sidekick. We've heard Owen say this to us. He said it at a big giant gathering around the movie with a thousand people. And people were trying to get him to embrace the role of the hero. That makes us more comfortable, right? Just one hero. Be the hero. And they asked him a question. Oh, and how does it feel to be a celebrity as a stand-in for hero? He's like, I'm not a celebrity. I'm a person being celebrated. They're different. <laughs> not bad. Again, define your terms. If you don't know the supposed tos, that's where you go. But then you can tell Owen went into deep thought. Now, they've seen the movie, everyone there, so they know, don't rush him. He's going deep. This is the way it is with people on the spectrum. Owen is not different. Okay? Let me just tell you that. They're everywhere. The neurodiverse. But he's going deep. So everyone waits. Waits for him to go deep and then bubble up. He says... I think we're all really sidekicks at our best when we help others fulfill their destiny. And on that day, we find our inner hero. And that makes heroism of that, <laughs> of that beautiful construction. It makes it a choice, a choice we make each day. The reason I love teachers and educators, which my mother was, by the way, a teacher, is their sidekicks who help others fulfill their destinies. And in the Suskind family, we call that hero. Which is why it is a thing of great joy that I can be in this place where I found love to talk to people that I love. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. Have a, have a seat, and uh, we're going to bring up some people to uh, have a conversation. Um, and so please come up, uh, Dr. Hassan Minhas, who serves as the Chief of Autism Services at the Hospital for Special oh, hey. Care. He graduated with an MD from Walawind, uh, Rawalpindi Medical College in Pakistan and completed residency in psychiatry and fellowship in pediatric psychiatry at Brown University and a fellowship in forensic psych uh, psychiatry at Yale. Dr. Minhas provides leadership for Hospital for Special Care's nationally recognized continuum of services for children and youth with ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, which includes Connecticut's only ASD-specific inpatient and partial hospital programs. Dr. Alicia Stewart is an assistant professor in the Special Education and Interventions Department here at CCSU. She teaches graduate methods courses that focus on the implementation of evidence-based reading instruction and meaningful assessment for students with disabilities. Prior to joining CCSU, she received her PhD at the University of Texas at Austin, focusing on learning disabilities and behavioral disorders. 
And finally, Ms. Jessica Ofray is a licensed professional counselor in the state of Connecticut and has a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. She is a counselor in the Department of Counseling and Student Development here at CCSU. She views counseling as a process in which she supports students to navigate their unique journeys as they explore challenges, celebrate successes, and create meaningful change in order to achieve their goals. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the panel. All right. Dr. Minhas, you get the first question. Go. Oh, I get to ask the question. I thought you. Oh. <laughs> well, that was amazing. Um, you know, the thing that I find the most interesting about autism is it doesn't affect an individual, it affects the family, yeah. right? And it's, 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 not, it's, it's not something that I think a lot of people pay as much attention to. So as, as you heard, I went to medical school in Pakistan and people don't get autism over there, mm. right? Because they don't think it exists. Yeah. I thought that I was gonna go to the US and train and everybody would know what autism is mm -hmm. and how it works, but hmm. I was surprised that that wasn't the case. Yeah. What I'm curious to hear from you though is, in your journey, mm -hmm. how have you seen the evolution of how people understand autism, mm -hmm. both specialists that you've been to, but more importantly, general people? Well, you know, there's been an enormous evolution since uh, Owen is diagnosed uh, in 1993. Um, you know, Back then, people were still thinking about the wire mother monkey, that these children were this way because their mothers had denied love. I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Always blaming the mom. I mean, and, and of course, that all collapsed when they, you know, Rimland had twin studies. Uh, so they're different mothers. So how do you figure that? But you know, the fact is, is that I think that when we think of the change is that as people have become attentive to how vast the spectrum is and that all of us have qualities and traits that would be considered, I suppose, autistic, that we have both have, have created enormous progress, I think, in depathologizing much of what is the presentation of autism and understanding uh, how there is all sorts of capacity that if handled properly, if tapped through the affinity, which is our special contribution, uh, emerges. And that some of what we're, we see, especially from folks on the spectrum who are less involved, you know, we don't use higher or lower functioning because I think involved less or, or more involved is better, um, how they find uh, a pathway to not being seen as broken to be fixed, but to find a way to be just as they are with supports, okay? And that's a huge change. I mean, we grew up in a time with Owen as young adults where it was fix him. How do you fix him? He's broken. And we don't know why he's broken. And we don't know why the diagnosed incidents, well, you know, that's obviously a carefully wrought term, <laughs> keeps skyrocketing. But we're in a, such a different time now for the good. I mean, the fact is there are lots of people who say, I'm autistic. I'm like, yeah, right, and me too. But, you know, Elon Musk, I'm on the spectrum. Greta Thunberg, who's, you know, Elvis. She's like, you know, Joan of Arc for everything. I mean, she says, and she is clearly, her strengths are expressed not in spite of, but because of her neurodiversity. As she says, she's like, I have to attend to the truth. I don't have a choice. That's the way I'm built. Now, at the same time, it has created, I think, some confusion as to how 
vastly distinct people on the spectrum are in the lives that they live. Now, we have very dear friends where they have contemporaries of Owen who, you know, are, are self-injurious and have no speech and can't manage, you know, you know, they're not toilet trained, and they're in their 30s. It's hard for us to say Owen and they are a single thing. And I think that the difficulty, as you know in medicine, you know, Tom Insel's a buddy of mine, and you know, he talk, he was head of National Institute of Mental Health. And, you know everybody, don't you? Well, you know, that's kind of the journalist's job. You have to kind of meet everyone, you know, and fake that you know as much as they do, which is, you know, you learn over time. It's a skill. And, um, but, you know, he threw out the DSM 4 famously and saying, you know, the way we designate pathology and illness, you know, it needs an overhaul. Now, part of what Tom and I have talked about over the years is how problematic some of the labels are by virtue of how vast this distinction is. Um, now, I am up in Boston. You know, MIT is lousy with people on the spectrum, as is Caltech, but they're able to function somehow, effectively, in a society that is much more accepting of them and the other thing that I think is powerful is that in this information-drenched age, the informational compensatory strengths of processing that spectrum people have, around their affinities especially, is not seen as necessarily a handicap. Some of the great inventions are from autistic spectrum people who go a thousand feet deep, fill up glass, I mean, you know, there are thousands of great inventors and thinkers on the spectrum. And just the, this kid, I talked about to the kids earlier, all the folks that I see uh, when I give speeches to, uh, I have them come up afterward, and I say, what's your affinity? What's your thing? And they tell me amazing stuff, amazing stuff. I mean, I had a young lady who came up to me after a speech not too long ago, and she's like, I said, so what's your thing? What's your affinity? Your passion? And we used to think that was an obsession. It's not. It's a different part of the brain. It's a passion, but a narrow, deep one, okay? She's like, well, dinosaurs. I said, okay, dinosaurs, are, they're this big. That's, a lot of people are into that. Well, how about you? What's your, what part of it? She's like, well, there's a certain dinosaur, but I don't want to tell you because you'll laugh at me. I'm like, I promise, I promise I won't laugh. Try me. She's like, well, the dinosaur I love is the Velociraptor. I'm like, okay, that's a bloodthirsty monster dinosaur. What? The raptor. Talk to me. Why the raptor? Well, the raptor is a pack animal. Now, the thing about a pack is they're not all the same within the pack. And the key, really, is they, there's a kind of interdependency that grows up where if they work together, which raptors do, like many animals in packs, uh, they can take down a much larger dinosaur. And the key is seeing the fit of strengths in unison, which is really about understanding who people are. I'm like, she just did social dynamics of raptor populations. That's a PhD thesis instantly. Now, that's a person wrongly who is in the discard pile, probably, of the way we educate. Why? She can't be a proper generalist. She can't look at this and look at that and run across a wide array of diverse subjects to hit the bell on that test. No. She's got love. She loves knowledge and lives on it. World in a grain of sand, just like the William Blake poem from 11th grade. Eternity in an hour. That's who this neurodiverse population is. And at the same time, there's some who are just in hell and really need all sorts of supports and help. And we've got to dig, dig, dig to figure out whether it's our friends at CRISPR or wherever to try to see if there is a way for a better life there. A long answer to your question. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Dr. Stewart. 
So um, I'm in the world of special education and just education, I should say. And so um, I really enjoyed in the book, you spoke so much about your experience with education and really the ugly parts of it, right? Yeah. Because there are quite a few and it, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. Yeah. Um, and, and this sort of connects to what you were just mentioning as well with um, sort of, we have all these beautiful strengths in, in people that need to be honored. Yeah. And it, it, sometimes the system seems to put people in pegs, you know, and, and not everybody is the shape of the peg they're trying to work yeah. with. So, um, and that's of course something in, in our field that we really focus on the individual, right? And focusing on their strengths, their affinities yeah. and working with them. And so I'm wondering if you can speak a bit more to if you did ever have any experiences with any sort of educational setting, really I'm thinking public education at all, yep. that did do that mm. with Owen. And um, if they did, what, what stood out as particularly mm -hmm. beneficial? And if it wasn't in a public setting, that's absolutely yeah. fine. I would yeah. love to hear about anything yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that stood out. Yeah, I mean, you know, Owen went to the Catherine Thomas School in the, on the, the Washington suburbs in, in Potomac. And it worked out for him. Okay, that's kind of the one public-like thing he, he was at. And it was like, it felt like a public school. It was pretty big. And what they did there was basically, like, I mean, we have the capacity now in the digital age that everyone should have an IEP. I mean, every student. There are moments where we see Walter. Now, Walter went to Sidwell Friends, you know, which was a fortune. But, you know, we used to say if Walter could get the education that Owen gets, he would be so much better off because everyone should have an IEP. I mean, really, we can do that. You know, because everyone learns in their own way. And the fact is to make you learn like you learn like you learn, what is that about? I mean, no, I learn in the way I learn and I, learn, I do it well. Feed me, let me dive deep. And the fact is, this amazing thing we've got here allows us to go literally into the bottom of the ocean on any subject. I mean, it's all here. It's a, we're in a Gutenberg moment, for Christ's sake. And so that's what we're not harnessing. And the schools that did well for Owen, like Catherine Thomas School, did that. Now, they also were enormous in their care for him, you know, and an attentiveness. Now, he was bullied there, you know, and it was a terrible bullying. And we didn't find out for months. But, you know, when we did, they acted, you know, and they acted well and forcefully, and it really saved them. You know, that was his place, and, and the kids who bullied him left. They're like, sorry, you know, you can't be here and have him here. And we're not going to have him leave because you're here. You're going to have to find another place to go. Um, but, you know, I think we're coming around to everyone with an IEP, little by little. I think society is doing it. And the fact is the kids learn so much from this already. It's a challenge to special ed teachers and all teachers, actually. You know, compete with it. It's hard. I mean, it's a, it's a real, this is a, this is a profound challenge to the pedagogue. Because this is so interesting. If they can be guided on their spelunking into the world of digital, uh, they get a, an ownership of that, and they feel strong from that search and find. That's what I find with, with students. Quick, quick question. Um, IP, just for the, the people out there. What's an IP? Oh, an, oh. It, well, you do it. Oh, is it? IEP, Individualized, Individualized Educational Plan. Thank Individualized you. Okay. Educational Plan. Right. I'm sorry. Just, uh, that, yeah. was a, that was like an acronym-y right. thing. Ms. O'Frey, you're next. Um, so I watched the documentary and I was curious and um, about when or Owen's process from going from interacting with just like his core family to becoming so social and running even the Disney club at his school and kind of what that process was of, you know, developing his speech and then kind of like the social interactions in a more um, like peer group. Well, it's interesting because, you know, the, the Disney club, which and we have a clip that I didn't run here, but it's a clip of Disney Club. Um, uh, it ends up being a, almost a model, actually, 
of how social interaction can grow and occur. Because the key is everyone at Disney Club is an expert on Disney. Okay? So they were all doing what Owen did. We thought we have this unique wood hopu among the starlings. But no, they're all wood hopus. They're all Disney kids, Disney people. And what was interesting is how they were all using lines, lyrics, dialogue, scenes as the shared place. So Owen was able to essentially speak a language of social engagement through the affinity that they all spoke. They all were fluent in it. And it was amazing what was said in Disney Club. I mean, it's just it's breathtaking. And the parents are like, I'm sending my kid back to, the, to you know, R Riverview School is the one that came. Uh, I'm sending him back because of Disney Club. It's like, it's changed them. I mean, let me just give you an example. I'm up there, and, and at the beginning, when Cornelia and I were the facilitators, you know, we were just like wild people. We were, you know, running around, you know, doing crazy stuff. And just trying, to, you know, we're therapists without licenses, basically. And, and I, I get a little thing, and, you know, the mirror in, uh, in Beauty and the Beast, the magic mirror, I have a little thing which serves as the mirror. I said, so if you had the mirror, I said to one of the kids, what would you ask to see? And the kid takes the mirror, and he, he's transported. Again, that's common for spectrum. They're method livers. And he goes, I'd like to see myself as an older man. You see, my dream is to cross America in a Winnebago and to see it through that big window. And I want to see if that happens. And I want to see that guy, see how much he is me, how much of me remains. <laughs> now, there's not an 18-year-old on the planet in the land of the neurotypical that would come up with that. I mean, there isn't. That's what happened at Disney Club, OK? And we just then stepped back and just said, whoa, baby, don't get in the way. They're doing it. And, and that can happen through almost any affinity. I mean, that's the beauty of it. That's when we built the affinity project. That was the idea, a place where people would share content together digitally in a safe way because often folks in the spectrum get preyed upon digitally. They miss social cues. They don't realize what's happening. But here you could vet it to say, so Owen has 10 people, and those are the 10 people that we know who they are, and he knows who they are, and they're the ones who get to join him in a little cul-de-sac, digitally speaking, that has his essentially Disney Club membership. And they hang out, and they search the Internet, and find stuff, and I find a clip, and then you find a clip, and I find a clip, and you find a clip, and they're using it as language. They're using it as a shared place, as both mirror and window. A mirror to them and a window to you. That's very hopeful. Okay, two of your, two of your earlier books have in their subtitles the education of, the education <laughs> of Paul O'Neill, the education of a president. And in your, in your talk, you made it very clear that the subtitle of this book is The Education of the Susskind Family. That's right. Um, in watching you um, and the way you, the way you tell this story, the way you uh, learn to interact with Owen, I want to know how much of an actor, right, what kind of acting education have you received hmm. from this experience? Acting education? Yeah. The voices, the, all of those things. Well, OK. <laughs> it's interesting. Well, look, so the, the thing about that mother that you met earlier on, about an hour ago, um, you know, she was very much like entertain the dinner guests, and you get dessert, OK? <laughs> and ever since I was a little peanut, I did like the Isaac Dennison thing, okay. like someone would throw out the first <laughs> line of a uh, and, you know, the elephant was lost. I would say that's because the circus 
well, the cage was left open. And you see, he really wasn't a circus elephant. And I would tell a story. And that was the thing I did. Okay. Now, um, I do voices too. Owen does them better than I do. He's got an ear that's insane. Because I do voices that really are, I steal it from a voice person like a comedian who does a voice. So like, like there's a time when I was talking to Bill Clinton. Now I'm really stealing that from somebody else I heard. Owen doesn't do that. He actually hears it. And he has intonations that you miss. But I've always done voices. So when Owen and I do voices together, and he does them better than I do, but I'm pretty good at it. But he, again, runs circles around me in ways that I love. I mean, well, I mean, this is part of the joy of the whole thing. Here's Ron, meritocracy champion, and here's Owen in the discard pile. He will now run circles around his father. It's like a circus act. And I will tell you this, though, is that, is that through all six books, Cornelia says, you're a great writer, honey, but you actually tell the stories better than you write them, which she's right about. I mean, I've told stories on stages where, I mean, it's, it's, it's as close as I get to, you know, to spiritual transference. And, and it just convinces me again and again not that I need it, but it just affirms it. It's all story. There's nothing else. I mean, my God, you know, Barack Obama told the story. He told it over and over again and then lived it in present tense. You know, we're not red America and blue America. We're the United States of America. <laughs> and then he lived it. That's the beauty. When you can tell a story and then be at the center of that story you tell. People just, because oh, it's occurring in front of them. It's a story that is essentially historical improvisation. Now, of course, Donald Trump did a similar thing. So it can happen in a lot of ways, for good or for evil. Now, I'll tell you one funny little twist with Walter, where we were watching Star Wars, you've all seen that one too, and it was one that was re-released, and Walter's only five years old, and, uh, and he saw that scene where Obi-Wan Kenobi says, these are not the drones you're looking for. <laughs> okay, go on your way. And Walter said, looked at me, he's five, he's like, that, that, that's what you do. <laughs> and I'm like, I do not. He's like, yes, you do. And later, Walter would say, Dad, if you just use these powers for good, we'll all be happy. <laughs> but you see the way these powers can be used for good or ill. But it's all story. And a lot of folks, including Obama, when I interviewed him, you know, we, I, we had this long interview in the Oval Office, and it was a hard one for him. And I told him that right at the start. He's, his favorite book uh, was Hope in the Unseen. You know, He's, I love your book. You know, how's Cedric doing? How's the kid doing? You know, we're right there. I was on the mustard couch. He was on the wing chair with the bus of, you know, of the King and Lincoln behind him. We talked about Cedric, kid from Hope in the Unseen. I said, it's going to be a really tough interview for you, Mr. President, just so you know. But if we make it through the first half and get to the second half, it could be the most important interview you do as president. Okay, let's go. So, <laughs> the <t> <laughs> The twist of this is that Obama at one point in the interview says, you know, here's the thing. You know, Carter, Clinton, and I suffer from what I call the policy wonks disease. You know, I didn't get to be president because, you know, I had the right position on a policy. I had the right stance here or there. It's because I told a story to the American people of who we are and where we're bound. And that's what got me here. Now, as president, I feel like I've lost my narrative. Okay? 
story. Okay, now this is for the three panelists. All right. Um, the Suskinds come with, uh, with the three-year-old Owen for you, Dr. Minhas, and then a, uh, an older Owen to you, Dr. Stewart, and then to a college-aged oh, Owen I love this. Uh, to you, uh, um, Zofre. Gil, what do baby. you say to them? What do you, what do you, what do you do? What do you offer them? Okay. I'm going to turn so, the tape recorder. There <laughs> So uh, they, they come to the hospital for special care. What, uh, what do you have to offer? That's a good question. I'm getting like $1,000 worth of consultation here. This is amazing. I have three of them. That's exactly what I was going Thank through. Thank you, Gil. Jesus, this is wonderful. You know, it's, so going back to what you said about how it's such a spectrum, it's, it's hard to give one specific answer that fits all. Um, I would go back to what you said about storytelling, right? So all of us have stories. Owen, when he comes to see me, when he's three, he has a story. When Owen's five, he comes to me to see me, he has a story. And they're different stories. Yeah. I don't think it's my job or, well, it shouldn't be my job to try to extract a story that I want to hear. Mm. So the job really should be to be a canvas. For, for the Owen who's three or the Owen who's five to sort of tell whatever story is in there, right? It could be Jafar's story. It could be his um, dad talking in New Britain where he found love. It could be that story, right? And, and my job is then to take what that story is and to understand it in the paradigm of science and with, with the little understanding of the brain that we have um, don't tell Tom until I said that. <laughs> <laughs> He's a famous psychiatrist. Anyway, so, and, and, and to use that information to, to understand who, who Owen is. And, you know, it ends up being a philosophical, a difficult philosophical question, right? So as a psychiatrist who's working with children with autism, you don't want to become the person who tries to fit the square peg into the triangular um, hole. But at the same time, you want to work on helping John, who is destructive and unable to regulate his bowel movements. You want to help him to be able to regulate to a certain degree, right? And, and that ends up being a spectrum too, right? So wh where, where do you stop intervening and where do you let the child flourish in, in what they're doing? And, it ends up being attributes, right? I mean, I, I, I joke with some of the kids and I say, I'm tall, which means I can play great basketball. I can't, but don't tell anybody, <laughs> right? But it sucks when I fly coach. It's terrible, right? And so that doesn't mean that height is good or bad. It's an attribute. And I use that attribute to my advantage sometimes, and sometimes it gets in the way. And, and, and my job for the tall child who has a hard time flying coach is to say, there's the exit row, mm -hmm. or you can you know, work really hard and be a journalist and get enough money to fly business class, right? <laughs> um, that's, that's good. Say, that's yeah. good. Thank you, doctor. That's, that's good. I mean, I'll send I love, you my bill after. I love it. I love that. I love what you said. Okay. All right, Dr. Stewart. Okay, well, if I were um, Owen's teacher at the time uh, and he came to me, the first thing I would want to do is learn about him. Yeah. I need to get to know him as a person. And I would do a lot of that with your help as well. Yeah. Um, working with families and building strong right. relationships with every child's family is essential yeah. to the work that we want to do. Um, and in addition to that, from there, of course, you're very familiar with an IEP, but we would work on whatever his goals were that we decided as a team. Yeah. And doing that, I think it's essential that we would work in his affinity yeah. and his interest to increase engagement and to allow him to flourish and yeah. right and to communicate. Yeah. So that's huge. That would be absolutely done. And then there's other ways to think about the ways in which we assess students, right? Mm. Yeah. If a child can show you something in a different way, there is a myriad of ways they can show you that they know something. Yeah. And so just the basis of universal design for learning, which is something that yeah. Every educator should do, yeah. whether it's a student with an IEP or not. Yeah. Um, and that kind of speaks to what you said earlier about that would be great for all students, right? Yeah. And we know that university does, universal design for learning is so 
easy to do, right? Mm -hmm. And we have um, Dr. Takamai, who's here, is a specialist in that. So I'm looking at her. She does a lot of work with UDL. But um, it's something that that we would, of course, look at and, and want to provide Owen the opportunity to show us what he knows in all of these different kinds of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and communicating and collaborating with his other teachers yeah. so that they also know yeah. that that's the way to work with That's Owen. a whole plan you just laid out. That's yeah. a beautiful plan. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, yeah, what, the question, UDL. I mean, change is so slow. Well, I, it's, it's amazing to me. There are days where I say, let me be a dictator, a benevolent one for one day. Now everyone does UDL. It's just, it's, it's, I mean, especially with large structural changes, it's just amazing. Generations pass when we know the answer, but it's not applied to the lives that are lived. I mean, I love UDL. Okay, all right. Owen is a, uh, is a first year student at CCSU, and trust me, the administration will love that, right? A little celebrity coming in, even if he doesn't think he's a celebrity, he would be. But anyway, so what, what do we have to offer? What does your office have to offer? Well, the dynamic in college would change slightly because unless Owen gives us expressed written permission, the parents would maybe not be involved. Of course, we would encourage it and welcome it, um, but it would really be up to him. And we would cater to what his goals and personal needs are in the sense of it's not what our vision of like a successful college student is or what path he should be on, but what he specifically needs as an individual and then working with him in his specific way of communicating. So what might work for one student may not work for the other. So if it's not talk therapy, then we get creative and, and do what will make him feel seen, heard, understood, connected, so that he can continue to seek services and support. And then hopefully connect him with, if let's say it's, I don't know, resources on campus or social peers, connect him to like the appropriate resources so that he just has a more enriched experience. So what kind of resources? And so, and, and real quickly, um, if, uh, if anybody has a question um, in the audience, you can go to one of, the, uh, one of the mics. And for those people who are online, if you want to uh, ask a question, you can go to the chat. And, uh, and ask away, but okay, back to you, Jessica. Yeah, so specifically in, for example, the Office of Counseling and Student Development, we developed a peer so social support group for students who are neurodiverse or who are on the autism spectrum to not only build and learn about social skills, but to practice them in a safe environment so they don't feel so intimidated um, going into, you know, just open, gatherings on campus so that they can approach classmates and peers with confidence and kind of build a, a sense of community. Um, but just at Central in general, we also have um, the office that works with students that have disabilities for academic accommodations. Um, there are specific like student run groups that focus on student I believe the group is called Autism Connect. So students run that group on their own and connect with each other. So there's different and different levels um, support that a student can receive at Central and just be like welcomed and um, respected as just individuals and just accepted for who they are without wanting or needing to change them. Okay, Mr. Susskind. Yes. In, in, in your travels and thank in you your, in your, your, in your yes, can, in your, I, in your. Can I thank oh. these doctors and specialists for your diagnosis? They're beautiful, every one of them is, I mean, this a whole life of Owen has just got mapped. Really? Thank you. And that's going to lead me. So what do, what do all these specialists need to do to interconnect, right? What do, and in, in your experience, have you found it, um, when have you found it working that the specialists at every level are working in unison? So mm -hmm. what does CCSU need to do more with the Hospital for Special Care? And what does uh, CCSU need to do more with the public schools, the private schools, whatever? So let's start with your experience and then okay. we'll, go around the, we'll go around the table. Well, you know, the thing that I find um, that crosses many of the specialties and borders and barriers um, and, it, and, and some of it's by virtue of what the healer does, what the caregiver does, 
what the doctor does, um, is, is in the mix. They forget about uh, the, the power of, of, of joy. I mean, it's not what you do. But it is the thing that drives so very much. It's something we found, Cornelia and I, where we would say, and say it to parents, and say it to doctors, uh, don't forget the joy. There's enormous joy in this person you're trying to help. Uh, the joy is often where their strength lives. Um, just by virtue of being in a place with the doctor, or sometimes the teacher who's special ed, or someone who is there to support services for those with a disability. Um, they, they, feel, they feel the burden of, of broken. And the thing about the joy is I always say to them, tell me what you love. Let's start there. And it changes almost anything. Because people are right to want to be known for their loves. It's the best thing to be known for. And when you start there, it actually opens them up to tell you all sorts of things that often would otherwise be never heard in Audible, that they will then tell you. Because you've seen them at that moment as Peer, equal, same, and equivalent, joy, joy. You got some too, I bet. And that's the thing that we, we have seen among some of the, the therapists who have been most successful. I mean, in the book, there's a guy named Dan Griffin, who is a, is a doctor of psychology in the Washington area. In, he, he was in Tacoma Park. And he is a joy guy. And we've helped him with that, mind you. He's sort of like the sus guys, you were part of that. But the progress that Owen made in engagements of joy with Dan, well, it was just stunning. And I think at the core of it was this idea of not broken, different, not less. And that's the thing that crosses all of it. Because it, it has you beginning from a different place. And that's what I would say that connects us all. Hassan. Yeah, no, I, I, I like what you said about approaching joy. I mean, and, and maybe after I, we talk about this, I, I want to come back to this. Because I think there's approaching the child. But what I find most challenging is, is actually what the first doctor, not the short Jewish guy, the, the, the one before that guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was a she, yeah. yeah. She, the one, yeah. The, right, the, the, right. the taller one, yeah. yeah. Um, it was, when, when you're in that position and when, when the parents are there hearing that news, it's, it's less challenging to hear what Owen has to say yes. or, to, or to see what Owen has to yeah. show. What's more challenging is not only to hear what the parents have to say, but also there's you know, in, in a field where there are very little answers, there's yeah. often misinformation, yeah. right? And then there's Google, right? So it's, it's a great device, but, you know, it's, it, it brings Jammed with, it with all disinformation, exactly. jammed with it. Um, and, and, and so I find, as part of my job, dealing with the parents, not only in terms of connecting, but also in terms of clearing up information and misinformation, um, and then not coming across as the person who's the person who knows everything, but at the same time keeping my patients from going to get chelation therapy yeah, yeah, yeah. and getting stem cell therapy, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, but maybe we'll come back to that. But I think, you know, coming to the question that you said, so I liked what you said about joy. There's this doctor who once said, you know, 90% of a physician's job is just to sit there and to hold a patient's hand. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And the other 10% is, you know, that trivial, but it's not trivial, but by yeah. comparison, right? And, and I think in this mm. context, holding a patient's hand is replaceable by sharing the patient's joy. Yeah, yeah, I love it, I love it. I mean, sharing the patient's joy, I mean, it's beautiful. And it, it means you're gonna have to get out of your skin, you might have to get down the rug, 
Yes. You might just have to show enormous attentiveness. I mean, attention is a kind of caring. And your attention is wrapped when they are bringing you in. Right. You know, I mean, uh, you know, yeah, I, I love that, the sharing of joy. It's about sharing it. That's the whole point of it, is sharing it. It has to be. And then, you know, going to the question that you asked, I think when it comes to the three of us, um, you know, that, that joy, right, if I, if I come across what the child's joy is, you need to know, you need to know, right, and, and, and vice yeah. versa. So, so at the hospital, for example, we, we make it a priority to reach out to schools and communicate and to make sure that we're all speaking the same language because the jobs, is, it, it's, it's hard as it is, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if one person makes the connection, you want to make sure that it's, it's shared amongst everybody. Yeah and that you're delivering things in unison, which, yep. which can be tricky because of logistics yep. and you know, there are very few of us of, uh, and, and services and we need more grant money, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially that's what it boils down yep. to. Yep. Alicia. Oh. What, <laughs> kind of, just what can, what can we do you know, kind of across, the, across the, the, the silos, if you will, you know, kind of uh, the hospital for special care is two miles away, right, as the crow flies. So what, what, do, what can we do with the, in the schools? What can we do with the Hospital for Special Care as an institution of education? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, it, we do become siloed sometimes. It yeah. does happen. And within the school system, for example, we're not as siloed because we're working with service providers within the system. But outside of the system, like the hospital, for example, is, is something that's more challenging to bridge that gap. But I, I would say that, I mean, within the PPT process here in Connecticut, which is when we meet to discuss the IEP, um, <laughs> it happens a minimum of once a year. And of course, I would hope this communication would be ongoing between all service providers across these these sort of um, feats here, but that's one opportunity to make sure that everyone is sort of involved in the conversation. Um, and I think one thing we could do a better job of in the school system too is to reach out, ask the parent, can you, can you know, the doctor put forth some information or come to the meeting. I mean, they're busy. They might be not able to attend, but maybe they can share some important information or we can have a phone conference on the side. We have to get releases for those sorts of things, but those are logistics and we could do that with families. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be really essential to have everybody's heads together, you know, and if there's something that we know that's joyful to in our setting, and that might translate to something even the doctor might want to know for speaking yep. with the family or whatnot. Yep. So. Yep. Thank you, Alicia. Okay, Jessica. Well, this is something that has actually um, been a current conversation in our office where we have reached out to the hospital social care to come and provide some training for us counselors because we may have you know, a general idea of how to support students, but that doesn't mean that that's it. Like we want to keep learning, we want to keep growing, we want to know where the trends are going so that we can meet those specific needs for all the different types of students that we may serve. Um, so just even tapping into other people's specialties and expertise and like learning from them and then hopefully, you know, in return we can share some of our experiences. Uh, but really just like learning from each other because every facet has such different insight and ex experience. So. Um, for us, it would be kind of just like learning and sharing information. Yeah. I have a nice sort of, uh, just what many were all saying, but you guys have articulated so beautifully, but th there's, a, there's a, a great one that I use that we, and it comes from conversations with some neuroscientists that we work with in some research that we're doing through the Affinity Project. And it's this, it's that, it's, and, and, and it works because it's easy to explain to patients, is that what we know now about the brain is very different <laughs> from how we viewed the brain 30 years ago. You know, and, and, you know, and you all know the history from those hemispherectomies, where you know, those kids who were essentially having epileptic seizures to death, they, and they had to remove half the brain and it's sort, of like, it's sort of like the modern version of Phineas Gage and the railroad spike. 
you know, which split his brain, which I always thought was fascinating in Abnormal Psych at freshman year at UVA, where they're like, yeah, he, you know, that's the guy who got the spike through his head. And they said, you know, he was irritable, had trouble sleeping. I'm like, he had a spike in his head. You know, but <laughs> I just thought it was like, wait a minute. Uh, but it was that the remaining half of the brain was doing significantly what both halves were doing. And that threw us off into the place where we are now, where many of my neuroscience friends are saying, it may not even be the gray matter, it may actually be the white matter, the neural connections between brain regions where the significant brain work occurs. So what's interesting about it is that the brain we now know is enormously plastic, is that the view that Gil and I had as kids, you know, from high school, the, the, the baby's brain is the largest thing in the known universe and we shed brain cells through our life and carve pathways. It's actually not that. We're growing brain cells this morning. We're doing it clearly this evening. You know, and, and what's the notion of plasticity, though, leads you to this lovely place, and I love this, is that for every deficit, every challenge, every stressor, the brain creates an equal and opposite strength, compensatory strength. So the question is not if, but where. So that's why my friend David Boyce, who's, who's learning disabled, he's dyslexic, you know, David memorizes everything. That's why he's unbeatable in court. He's literally at everything he hears at his fingertips. Owen is, is just bursting with compensatory strengths. All of us are. The fact is each of us has mixtures of deficits and strengths that defines who we are. The Spectrum folks are just really dramatic examples of that. So what's great about this is that when you say that to people, like a parent, I'm like, okay, if that's the deficit, what would be the compensatory strength? Well, it would be that. I'm like, there's your kid. Of course he can do that. He has to see things. He has to memorize them. He has to fit patterns together. He has to make out speech in a different way because that's not working, then this has to work 10 times as strong. It's X-Men strengths. And so that sets the parents and often the therapists on what I call the treasure hunt. Where are the compensatory strengths for this guy? If that's the challenge, that would be the strength. So what's great about that is that the way we look at the person on the spectrum, or the neurodiverse person, is that if, like, if I'm neurotypical, I'm kind of nicely balanced, 50-50. If I'm on the spectrum, I may be 60-40, 70-30, 80-20. We work furiously on the 20. Fix it, fix it, fix it. Usually doesn't work. We often forget about the 80 because that's not, we're not fixing that. What's great about this is it really is a neurological expression of different, not less. Okay? It's like, I'm just balanced differently than you. And it gives the spectrum person that affirmation. Different. So where are your compensatory strengths? I'm really good at this. I never make a mistake. I can do this 10,000 times, I won't make one mistake. You make a mistake on number seven, and number 18, number 104. So that's really good. You know, this is interesting to me in ways that you don't see. That's a strength. So I can do all sorts of things you can't do. What are those things? That's your career, okay? That's the way you reshape what they think out there. Let's go on a treasure hunt. I've got a spectrum person. Okay, talk to me. Where are his challenges? So that must be a strength. Yeah, I could use 10 of them. I, that would be the best thing he could do. And I would really need them. The other thing is that when folks in the spectrum work in diverse environments, especially a workplace, similar to my friends on the emotionally gifted folks with Down syndrome. They <laughs> invariably become the favorite employee. The people, someone people come to the store to see, who want them to help them. It's, there's no doubt about it. If I can just grab, I was going to talk to Insel about this. Just give me, throw me some NIH money. This is an easy study. 
go, go to any place and do a baseline survey of 20 establishments, you know, social environment, occupational, atmospheric, you know, how people get along, whatever, uh, how they treat customers. And then implant a spectrum person as an employee and then resurvey them. Everything gets better. And you can measure it with data, which you need. That's reality, more complex reality than the meritocracy with its narrow and I think bent yardstick allows. But reality that fits the complexity and the loveliness of life and its surprises. So that's some things I would do if we were all working together. Excellent. Okay, so we have two questions online, and then we'll end with uh, Dr. Minhas's question from you. Said that you had a question that you were that you wanted to ask. Is that okay? So first of all, this comes from Henry, Mr. Suskind. I'm both impressed and moved by how life animated intersects complex emotions, neurodiversity, artistic power, socioeconomic concerns, and the lives of you and your family. Could you talk a bit about your process for constructing a narrative that felt logical and tonally appropriate to you as the author in regards to all of these elements? Mm, oh, there you baby. go. You have, you have two minutes. Two minutes, ready. It's like Hillary Clinton in one of those debates. Ready, go. Well, uh, the issues are clear. <laughs> I have to construct this uh, with feel, uh, and I'm always reading as to where we are. Page 10 page 32, page 61, the reader's on a journey. What do they know? What did they learn from me? What still remains? Narratives work best when they move chronologically. That's the way we process the world and the way we live it. Always be careful to be attentive to the fact that we are a people in this era suffering from attention deficit disorder on a global scale. ADD on a global scale. <laughs> you must keep that audience in or you have failed. And they are easily distracted and their attention is often like a gnat. So just feed them Surprise. Don't give it away. Let it unfold. Give them twists and turns. When you think they think they know what's up, jerk them back. Oh, not what I thought. I was looking for the answer. Not yet. Set up punchline. Don't give away the punchline. Let it unfold. Now, don't throw the $22 words at them like that question. Because <laughs> as soon as I read that, I'm like, oh, I'm out. I don't want it. socioeconomic. Da, da, da. OK, let me tell you a very two-second story. Um, I learned this the hard way. A Cornelius family was in Connecticut. I'd write front page stories in the Wall Street Journal. And I would ride the train from Westport to New York to the Wall Street Journal office when we visited Cornelius, and I'd watch people read my stories on the, on the John Cheever Express in Connecticut. All right, this is Connecticut, all right? And I'm watching on a particular day, and there's a guy reading my front page story. And he reads down to the break, to the fold of the paper, and he throws away and he goes to the money and investing. I'm like, what just happened? I get up, I walk over and I say, excuse me. He's like, what? I said, hi, I wrote that story. What happened? He's like, well, right there, the nut graph, the bit, just like that question, which is a great question, all these big ideas together, he's like, that's what you said the story's about. I know everything I need to know about that. So, I'm out. So I don't do that. I write stories without that nut graph of why you should care. I let the character take you. And that's the way I get to all those issues without giving away the answers. Because life unfolds and it's irresistible to be part of it, someone else's life, as they walk through the world, if you do it right. Okay. We're cutting the second question from online and going right to yours, Dr. Minhas. Well, I think, Ron, you, you sort of answered that question. I mean, the, the question really was, um, 
much less of how to connect with, with the Owen, but how to connect with the father and the mother, right? Because yep. oftentimes in a clinical setting, and I'm sure it's, it, it may be similar in school settings, um, it, 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 these are heavy things, right? Especially for parents who are hearing these things for the first time. Yep. And, and it's always challenging to navigate the intricacies of how to delicately deliver something while not making it a PDD NOS type yeah, of a right, right, thing right. to sort of shoved away. So I uh, want to hear from your experience, yeah. what would be a good way to... Well, I got something interesting for you. So there's a, a center we work with called the Lurry Center, up, you know, at, at, which is Harvard's MGH, aut biggest autism center, one of the big ones in New England. And they have an interesting thing where after the parents get the news of the diagnosis, they actually have a room they go to which is one with soft lights and comfy chairs and music playing. And they have someone who goes to the room with them to talk to them. They sometimes have them watch our movie, actually. That's one of the things the movie does. People often, um, after they get the diagnosis, the therapists say, go on Amazon and watch this movie. OK, this is going to help you because this family is on a journey, but you see the way it ends, and you're gonna, it's gonna help you see the complexity, in a good way, of the journey you're on. And that in a way, you will find that what has occurred could be a greatest gift, okay? And, and I think that's, when it works well, an insight that zillions of parents have. Owen says, I don't want to be any different. I'm good. This is me. Okay? <laughs> We've learned not to fix him. It doesn't work, by the way. And over time, we've grown together. And he has grown in all the ways we hoped into the independent life fully realized that he dreamed of. He says, I want to live an independent life. You heard in the trailer, I said, you know, we worried about him failing, that he'd fall and fail. We're not worried about that anymore. He has the privilege to do that. And that's just the life that each of us, I think, in a way are entitled to. Um, so. I think that's the way to end. Um, everybody? Ron Suskind, Alicia Stewart, Hassan Minhas, Jessica O'Frey. Thank you, and I'd like to thank the uh, CCSU Media Board, the uh, New Britain Institute, the uh, Hospital for Special Care, and uh, the uh, New Britain Museum of American Art, and thank all of you here and everybody who was watching. Have a good evening, everybody.